Hey, what's up guys? This is my second video in the Linguistics 100 video series. And in this series, I'm gonna take you through every aspect of linguistics. So you're gonna have a good foundation in all the basics of what it means to study languages. Uh, this video is on phonetics, which is the study of speech sounds. In the last video, it was a basic introduction of what linguistics is. And now we're honing in on really the most basic aspect of linguistics. The most basic thing we can study as far as language go is the speech sound. Uh, in future videos, we're gonna work our way up through studying syllables, words, sentences. Uh, but in this video, we wanna focus mainly on the sound. Now, um, phonetics, like I said, phonetics is the scientific study of human speech sounds. And there's three different ways that you can study speech sounds, um, or three different areas, really. There's articulatory phonetics, which is the study of what exactly it is that human beings do with our tongues, our lips, our throats, our lungs, uh, exactly what you do when you're cr producing speech sounds. Acoustic phonetics is the study of the actual sound waves that are passing through the air, um, the frequency, the amplitude, the different properties of the sound waves. And auditory phonetics is the study of um, what happens when those sound waves reach your, the ear of the person that's listening. Um, we're going to focus mainly on articulatory phonetics in this course because um, that's the one that's most useful to language learners. Articulatory phonetics. All right, now when studying the movements and the motions of your vocal tract and all your articulators, um, phoneticians have a lot of really advanced technology. Um, they use ultrasounds, x-rays, uh, they put little things in your mouth and little cameras and they can view, they can do all kinds of really advanced stuff to tell what you're doing with your tongue, with your lips, with your throat. Um, you probably don't have any of those things and that's fine. Um, if you have a mirror or a camera to watch yourself in, um, that's going to allow you to do some pretty interesting stuff as well. Um, there have been some very embarrassing moments when I was at school after my phonetics class looking in the mirror going... And someone walks in, of course, because I was trying to study what I was doing with my tongue and my lips uh, when I pronounce dis different vowels and stuff. Um, but if you have a mirror that you can look at yourself in, uh, in the bathroom or, or wherever you are, um, then you'll be able to see some of the things I'm talking about uh, when you produce these speech sounds. And it'll be a lot, some stuff that you've never actually thought about. All right, classifying speech sounds. <clears throat> Uh, most human speech sounds can be classified can be classified with just three criteria, and that's voicing status, place of articulation, place of articulation, and manner of articulation. Gosh, for someone who's talking about speech sounds, I'm really stumbling over my words in this video. I think I need some water. Um, and so, three criteria for uh, for describing speech sounds. <clears throat> if you know uh, each of these criteria for a given speech sound, then you know exactly what that speech sound is. Uh, and we're going to go over each of these in more detail now. <clears throat> the first of which is voicing. All right, um, and we're going to go over this first because it's the easiest to understand. Uh, voicing means are your vocal cords vibrating? And the way to tell this um, is very easy. Take your hand and put it right on your throat, on your Adam's apple. And if you can feel your vocal, you'll be able to feel your vocal cords vibrating with your hand if they are vibrating. So let's go through some of these sounds um, right here where it says voiceless sounds. So we got s, sh, Did you feel your uh, voice? Did you feel your vocal cords vibrating with your hand when you did that? Let's move on to the... Um, the next set of sounds. Um, that S in Asia is not pronounced like a normal S. It's Z. But anyways, um, when you're pronouncing these, the second set of sounds, you should feel your vocal cords vibrating with your hand. There's a very pronounced difference between those two sounds. Um, and what we have here is uh, two sets of sounds that are exactly the same in every way except for in voicing. So the S sound uh, is exactly the same as the Z sound, 
um, sh is exactly the same as zh, f, and v, f, and v are exactly the same sound. They differ only in voicing. So I guess I shouldn't say they're exactly the same sound. They're almost exactly the same sound. And that's voicing. If your vocal cords are vibrating right there, then you have a voiced sound. <clears throat> Place of articulation is the next criteria we're going to need to know in order to describe speech sounds. And place of articulation just means um, what place in your mouth is a constriction taking place to cause that sound. We have uh, bilabial sounds, which are um, labial meaning lips and bi meaning two. So bilabial means that both of your lips are together. Um, labiodental means your lips are against your teeth. Um, actually, I'm gonna skip this slide because uh, this will take us to our next slide, and I'm going to give you a little detail um, about uh, each, each place of articulation. <clears throat> so in bilabials, both of your lips are together. Um, the only bilabials we have in English are b, p, and m. And you can see in the chart here, in the little, um, we have a sagittal view of the face, uh, the lips are together, which is causing uh, an obstruction to the airflow. Our next place of articulation is labiodental. Obviously, again, labial meaning lips, dental meaning uh, teeth. So in labiodental sounds, your upper teeth are pressed against your lower lips like this. Um, in interdental sounds, uh, inter meaning between. So you can tell these are pretty intuitive names. Um, Interdental means that your tongue is going to be between your lips. So, and v. In English, we spell those two sounds the same way, but they are two very different sounds. One is voiced, the other is voiceless. Um, alveolar sounds. All right, now your alveolar ridge is a portion of your mouth that is right behind your teeth. Uh, you can't see it in the video, but you might be able to touch it and, and feel it. Um, or do it with your tongue if you don't want to stick your finger in your mouth. <laughs> um, you can see it here in the sagittal diagram. Um, and the tongue is just, just touching right behind the, the teeth. And that's your alveolar ridge right there. So we have a lot of alveolar sounds in English. That's t, d, s, z, n, o, and er. All right, then we have velar sounds. Um, velar sounds are going to take place in the back of your mouth. Um, and so uh, with the other sounds, you're using the front tip of your tongue. This one is going to have the body or the back of your tongue going up against your velum, which is towards the back of your mouth. And we have three velar sounds in English. That's g, k, and ng. Um, ng being like at the word, end of the word song. Right? That's not two different letters. That's not an N and a G combined. That's one sound. It's N. Um, and that's just an example of a few different places of articulation we have in English. Um, there are more, and there are other places that are not used in English. Um, but I just wanted to give you the main ones in this video. Uh, the next criteria that we need to know about in order to describe speech sounds is manner of articulation. Um, and that just has to do with how the air is passing through your vocal tract. Um, place of articulation uh, talks about where in your mouth the, a constriction is taking place. Uh, the manner of articulation is really talking about what kind of constriction or what kind of obstruction to the airflow uh, is inherent to that speech sound. Um, and I have a few different types of speech sounds here on the side. We're going to go over these in a little more detail. Stops. <clears throat> All right, let's do an experiment really quick. Um, it, let's pretend you're going to have a competition with a friend to see who could hold out an S, song for, S sound for the longest. And that competition will go something like S until you run out of air. And you could do the same thing with a vowel. Ah, until you run out of air or mm. you could do it with a bunch of speech sounds. Try doing it with a B. B. <laughs> right? Um, the point of a stop sound is that all the air 
in your vocal tract is it actually comes to a complete stop. Um, so for these sounds, uh, you're going to have a complete obstruction of air. Um, and so the stop sounds in English that we have are b, p, d, t, g, and k. Um, fricatives are um, uh, close to stops, but not quite. With a stop, you, act, you have um, some closure of your vocal tract that completely stops air. With a fricative, you have a very narrow space that allows air to go through, but you're gonna get kind of a hissing, frictiony sound. Uh, and the friction and the, the fricatives we have in English are v, f, f, v, s, z, sh, z, and h. That last one is kind of interesting. Just sounds like you're sort of breathing a little bit. Um, but there actually is some friction uh, going on in your uh, throat there, so that's why it's a fricative. All right, uh, nasals are a little bit more difficult to describe technically. So what happens in a nasal is um, you're gonna lower the back of your, your velum so that it allows air to pass up through your nasal cavity and out your nose. Uh, meaning that if you plug your nose, you can't produce nasal sounds. Mm. I guess you can pronounce them a little bit, but after a while that air is gonna build up and uh, it won't be able to exit out of your nose. You also should be able to feel, uh, if you put your finger right there when pron pronouncing some of these nasal sounds, you should be able to feel a little bit of air. Mm. Um, and there's no air coming out of your mouth because um, you're necessarily going to have to make some closure in your mouth for to have a nasal consonant. Um, so with an M, you're closing it off at your lips. With an N, you're closing it off right here at your alveolar ridge. Uh, and then with N, you're closing it off, um, you're closing off your mouth in the back of your mouth with the back of your tongue. And so that's what causes nasal sounds. You're actually putting air through your nose because it can't escape through your mouth. <clears throat> so mainly we've been talking about different ways of producing consonants so far in this video. I wanna talk about vowels a little bit. <clears throat> vowels can also be described uh, using just three criteria. That's frontness, height, and lip rounding. Now you can see here in this, um, in this picture that I have on the side, um, it's another sagittal view of the mouth, um, and I have a little square, a little quadrilateral uh, right in the middle of the mouth, and that quadra quadrilateral corresponds to the position of the tongue when producing vowels. Now, with consonants, you have some kind of obstruction or constriction to the airflow um, that is hindering the air a little bit, but with vowels, they're much more open and much more free for the air to come out. And it's only a matter of where your tongue is located in your mouth that's going to shape the sound that you're producing. So with ah and a, ah, um, your tongue is gonna be at the lower portion of your mouth. With e and a, it's gonna be in the front of the mouth. With u and u, uh, it's gonna be in the back of the mouth. And with u uh and a, uh, it's gonna be right around the center of your mouth. Um, so we can divide uh, we can divide this this quadrilateral um, into two axes, uh, which ranges from front to back and low to high. And then the only other criteria we need for determining uh, speech sounds is lip rounding. So with oo, your lips are round, and with e, you can see your lips spread out. Um, and so these are the three criteria that we need for describing vowels articulatorily. Um, like I said, you only need three, you only need three attributes to be able to um, unambiguously describe a speech sound. Um, for example, there's one voiced labial nasal sound and that's mm, okay? No other sound can be described as voiced bilabial nasal. Uh, there's only one low back, low back vowel, that's ah. Um, there's no, like, there, you just, that only describes one sound. Um, and we'll be able to describe a whole range of sounds using just these three criteria. <clears throat> um, well, three for consonants and three for vowels. Um, but 
If every time we want to refer to a certain sound, we have to use these big, long, scientific words, uh, that's going to get really cumbersome really quick. So we have a shortcut for cutting down the amount of time that it takes to describe a certain sound. And that is the IPA. Um, you may have seen this in dictionaries where they use a bunch of symbols that you don't understand. Some of them look like they're English letters and some of them look like they're made up. Um, that's the International Phonetic Alphabet. Um, and what we do for with the International Alphabet is that we will uh, assign one speech sound, one symbol. So it's a lot easier than English where you have letters like C that can be pronounced as S or as K. Um, you have letters like T that can be pronounced like uh, the T in ambition or the key T in cat or the T in train which sounds like it starts with a CH for some reason. Um, all kinds of different TH, uh, T sounds. But it's not that way with the IPA. We have one symbol per sound. Um, and so rather than writing out bilabial voiceless stop, um, all you have to do is just write the one symbol. And we're going to go over some of these symbols now really quick. Some symbols in the IPA are already familiar to you, and these are the symbols down here in the bottom left corner. We have b, p, m, woof, v, d, t, n, s, z, o, k, g, h. Um, there are some other symbols that you're probably not familiar with, uh, or they represent sounds that you would probably not expect them to. For example, the R sound looks like an upside down R in the IPA. <clears throat> the ch sound. Um, looks like a T and a kind of a weird stretched out S. Uh, J is a D and this, um, I don't know how you would describe that symbol, but uh, after that we have sh as in shoe, like, you know, um, stretched out S. We have the J as in Asia or like, you know, it's a very common sound in French, Jacques or Jean. The J in the IPA is pronounced the way that we would expect to pronounce a Y in English. So um, for words like yes or you, those are going to be spelt with a J in the IPA. <clears throat> and then finally we have un. Um, like I said earlier, the, the sound at the end of the word song is, that's one sound. We spell it with two letters, but it's a single sound, and it's not a G, it's not an N, we don't say sang, that sounds really weird. It's a single sound, and it's pronounced like an N, except at the back of your throat, um, or the back of your, your mouth, um, so it's a velar sound. Mm. Uh, moving on to the vowels. If you speak any of the Romance languages, um, then this might be a little bit more intuitive. Um, the, the sounds that the IPA uses uh, don't necessarily correspond exactly to the way we would pronounce them in English. So for example, this first one is E, then we have E, um, and if we have a lowercase E and an uppercase I, then that would be pronounced as A. Um, this backwards three looking thing is a, then this next symbol is called ash. We call that, um, it's pronounced as a. Uh, the next one that sort of looks like an uppercase a without the line in the middle, it, we call that a wedge, and it's pronounced as a. Uh. And the next symbol is interesting. Um, this is a schwa, and it's pronounced a. Uh. It's very similar to the wedge, and if you can't, if you have trouble telling the difference between these two sounds, that's okay. Uh, even a lot of linguists and phoneticians have a hard time hearing the difference between those two sounds. Um, but the wedge would be used in words like up, the schwa would be used in words like about, and you can tell, if you listen really carefully, when I say up, that's, that's a, a stronger uh sound, and in about, it's weaker and it's it's a very similar sound, but it's just not quite the same. We have a schwa, which is um, kind of an R-colored vowel, um, and this is a really uh, hard to grasp area of phonetics. Um, vowels, uh, whenever R follows a vowel, they just they sound weird to me. <clears throat> um, but the schwa would be pronounced as er, and that is a vowel. Um, and then we have a as in hot 
aw as in caught. Uh, if you're from California, you might not have two different vowels here. Uh, so if you would say the word cot, C-O-T as in the small folding bed, and the word caught, C-A-U-G-H-T, uh, as in I caught the ball, you might pronounce those two words the same, uh, and that's okay. Um, but, uh, so, so, the, so the difference between those two words would be caught and caught, um, and the difference between the two sounds is ah and aw, ah, aw. It took me a long time to be able to hear the difference, um, but I, after a lot of practice listening, I did realize that I do pronounce those differently. Uh, moving on to O, uh, that's what O looks like. Then U uh, looks kind of like a horseshoe. Uh, and then U, uh, as in U. So after we have learned all of these, uh, all of these uh, international phonetic alphabet symbols, um, you should be able to write out anything you would want to write in your language. And it takes a lot of practice. Um, I've only described the main speech sounds in English. Um, there's a lot more in the actual uh, IPA vowel chart and the consonant chart. Um, so you're going to have, if you're learning a foreign language, uh, you're going to have to look up those sounds in that language. But for now, now that we have a basis in English, we should be able to pronounce uh, these sentences here. And this first one is, I fart in your general direction. The second one is, Romans go home. And the third one is, your hovercraft is full of eels. So that's all I have for this video. Uh, I hope it interests you and it gives you a good understanding of how phonetics works. There's a lot more that I could have said that I just didn't fit into this video. Uh, I encourage you to look up the speech sounds that are used in your target language and figure out exactly how those sounds are produced. And now you have the tools to do so.